of G minor from book one. And as many as five voices, and again, there's, there are only two that are five voice fugues, and they're also in, in book one. So that's the C sharp minor and the B flat minor, and they're both very slow fugues, but they have five voices. So most of them are in three or four voices, the majority. So when you see these initials, WTC, that stands for Well Tempered Clavier. You'll see it abbreviated that way a lot. So that's one of the ways that Bach fugues are described, having to do with the number of voices in the fugue. And what you'll have And the Bach fugue is this general idea. That you'll have a statement of the subject in a single voice. Technique dates back to the beginning of the High Renaissance, the, the style of Josquin Dupre, who was writing works in, in a vocal medium. But it has to do with this layering of voices, one on top of the other, that are all sounding the same melody. So this subject is the basis, that's the basic theme of the feud. And so, like a typical Baroque work, it has to do with this one character, this one emotion. And so, the subject is stated. A second voice then restates that subject on the dominant level, so either a fifth higher or a fourth lower. That's called the answer. And the reason I put dominant level is that it doesn't really modulate. It just might temporarily shift. There are answers that are real answers, and then there are answers that are tonal answers. Real answers have to do with an exact restatement of that melody, a fifth above or a fourth below. The tonal answer adjusts um, you know, certain pitches so that it doesn't sound like it's immediately modulated to the dominant key. So we'd have to get in that part too. But at any rate, the second voice answers with a statement on that dominant level, while the original voice then gives a counterpoint against that. And so that's where that idea of counterpoint has to do with. The term counterpoint is based on the idea of a given melody. And the term for a given melody is cantus firmus. So I don't know if you've run across that term if you guys talked about cantus firmus yet. Anyway. So medieval music was based on Gregorian chant, a lot of it. And so they would take these given melodies from the chant literature and then construct these wonderful compositions based on these cantus firmus melodies. So that's the idea of, of counterpoint, is that you have a given melody that's you know, the, the given points of the pitch, and then you write a counter melody against that, a counterpoint against it. And so originally, this developed 
as a, a polyphonic type of work, but it wasn't so much concerned with the idea of vertical combination of, of tones, but instead was based on intervals that were created between the two voices or among three or more voices. And so it wasn't until the beginning of the Baroque period that you start to have this, this uh, concept of harmony that emerges. So Bach's fugues are so fantastic because they function within a tonal framework of tonal chord progressions, but they um, very much are linear in their orientation. And so um, you would you know, describe these as being polyphonic, um, and it has to do with this imitative counterpoint where multiple voices are sounding the same melodic material, but just at different rhythmic points. And so they're all woven together in this fantastic texture. Um, but it does follow the basic rules of, of chord progressions that emerged in, at the beginning of the common practice period. So when this answer occurs, then, that original voice presents a, a counterpoint to the answer. If that's something that's used consistently, then you can use the term counter subject. And that just is something that's optional. Many Bach fugues will have a counter subject, but it's not something that's, that everyone does. So that's what happens with the original presentation in tonic, and then the answer that's on the dominant level with the counterpoint against it. Then each voice enters in this opening section of the few, which is called the exposition. So they use the same basic terms as Sonata Allegro, so it's sometimes confusing. So I'll just put here, each voice enters. So each voice states the subject. And it's in a layered effect. And so once all, you know, if it's two voices, then just, you know, that exposition ends with that second voice. If it's three voices, then when that third voice comes in with a statement of the subject, when that concludes, then that's the end of the exposition. But you can have up to five voices that enter. And they'll all enter on either the tonic or dominant level. So it's, they're all on one of those two um, key levels. And so that opening section then has all the voices stating that subject. Then you have a connecting passage that's called an episode. Episode very often will have a reduction in the number of voices. So let's say you have a four voice fugue and each voice then states the subject. And then you have the first connecting passage, it might reduce to two voices. And um, the basic idea of the episode. is that it typically doesn't feature a complete statement of the subject, but it's based on the subject, so it's based on motivic elements from the subject, typically, or something that's in the same character.
So that's the, the, the thematic uh, character. Um, and the function of this is, is to link and, and to modulate. So it connects to the next passage where you're going to have statements of the subject. So, in your Benward uh, theory textbook, he talks about the you know development, you know, which um, it, it is, in, you know, in a sense. Many theorists will talk about the, the the term middle entry, and that you have this series of middle entries in a variety of keys that are connected by episodes. So basically, you either have a statement of the subject or you have connecting episodes, and so. That is what happens after this initial episode, which typically would take the music to either the dominant key, if it's in a major key, or relative major, if it's in a minor key, which are the typical modulating keys within Sonata Allegro. You see the same kind of thing here. With the middle entries, though, you don't have the reduction to a single voice like you have at the very beginning. It just, you know, will state the subject in one of the voices in that new key. And you might have a couple of statements, um, and then it's going to have another episode that's going to modulate to another key. And so you have this series of, of middle entries and episodes. Um, a lot of times at the end of the fugue, you'll have a strato passage, which kind of you know brings it to a climax. You'll have final um, statement of the subject in tonic um, to conclude the fugue. But that's the basic idea that, that you're going to look for. It's not as formulaic as Sonata Allegro. It's more of a general kind of concept, but you definitely have some things that you're looking for. Um, and there's definite things that you can say about what to expect in a Bach fugue. And it's one of the more you know, structured of the Baroque forms. And um, so, this is what we'll look for in the example that we're going to listen to in a minute, which is the, uh, the G major prelude and fugue from the first book of Walter Ricoeur. All right, with the preludes, So it's a collection of all the different types of possibilities for keyboard writing. So you'll have some preludes that resemble dances. So you might have one that resembles an allemand, for instance, or a jig, you know, and there are characteristics we talked about with these different dance types. You'll have, for instance, in the very first prelude of the Well-Tempered Clavier, it is called the Steel Brise, which has to do with a lute style. So just playing chord progression one note at a time. So. You have some that are in a French overture style. What does that have to do with? Do you know that term, French overture? That was a style associated with Lully and um, Louis XIV. 
That's his royal music, and it featured dotted rhythms. So it was slower, but it's this processional, uh, regal music. You have some that are like a trio sonata. What would you think with the, the texture of a, of a Bach prelude that is like a trio sonata? How do you think that he would simulate that? So how would you describe a trio sonata texture? So think back to Corella. So what was the, the texture? So how many solo instruments did you have? Two. two. So there are two voices that are written in the right hand, and the left hand is just playing chords. And so that gives that kind of texture. And there are some that are in the the uh, style of a toccata. What does toccata mean? Touch. To touch. So it is a keyboard work, and it was always associated with uh, virtuosic writing, so lots of fast scale or arpeggiated material. So the one that we're going to listen to is a type that's similar to a toccata. It's this perpetual motion, very fast, and this is just arpeggiating harmonies. Both hands have, a, you know, shot at it. So at any rate, there is a wide variety. You'll have a lot of times with these dance types. What form do you think that would be written in? Binary form. So you have a lot of the Bach preludes that are dance types that are in binary form. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing the, uh, the variety that, that Bach creates with, with the preludes. So this um, open, more improvisatory uh, opening section that's called the prelude, and then it's followed by the fugue, which is, is more um, closed. All right. publishing company Dover produces um, the scores and you know, editions that um, are reprints um, of earlier editions. And so this is a reprint of the Bach Gesellschaft from 1850. And that's why you have this old notation of the sharp that's next to the treble clef that's on the first space. So that's just an older style of notation. And um, so the prelude is just two pages, and it just takes this one idea and continually spins it out. So both hands have um, opportunity to, to play this, these triplet 16th note patterns. And at the end of the prelude, then both hands are playing uh, triplet sixteenths against each other. And that a lot of times is what happens. So in general, you have three notes in one hand against one note in the other hand. So one hand is active, the other hand is not quite as, as quick. But then he, he brings this you know, to a, um, a climax at the end when you have both hands moving in the fastest subdivision. And then that's followed by the fugue that is a 